Cinema Jaw is sponsored by Overcast, an independent podcast app that embraces the open world of podcasting instead of locking it down. No exclusives, no premium content, no paywalls. Just a great podcast app for everyone. Get it for free in the App Store. And we thank them for their support. Listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location at Cards Against Humanity in Chicago. My name is Matt Kay, and with me is Rye, the movie guy, and sitting behind the glass inside the fish tank is Phil Me and Phil. How's it going, guys? This week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, we get ready for the summer movie season with our summer movie preview. Yeah, I'm excited. Plus, I mean, this is a huge episode. I'll, I'll, we'll get to it. Yeah, obviously there's going to be a very big review mm. on this episode as well. Mm. But summer movie season, I commented to you as we were preparing for this. I know I was not this excited last time, uh, last year this time, looking at the movies of the summer that were coming out. I remember being a little let down. Not the case this year. I have a, I have a ton of movies listed in my summer movie preview that I can't wait to talk about and eventually can't wait to see. Yeah, I'm surprised you decided that we should keep it to top three because, I mean, I have some honorables. We should have done we, five. And we will. We'll mention okay. some as they, they pass. But we're cool. always trying to, you know, switch it up. And I know we're going to spend a lot of times with a certain movie this week. For sure. So we're doing a top three. But get this, Jawheads. We're also going to pick a hidden gem that each one of us thinks uh, is not on everybody's radar this summer. Yeah, but that's a great thing, right? Well done. I and applaud that. And helping us with this summer movie mm -hmm. preview is a great guest who is making a return, Matt. Yes, yes. Patrick McDonald will be here. He is making his second appearance. He's a fellow critic, entertainment broadcaster, al along with other great credits to yeah. his name. He also does a film tour here in Chicago. We'll talk to him about that. It's been a long time since Pat's been on the show. So Yeah, I'm glad to have him back. It's overdue. Yeah, Agreed. Absolutely. Besides that... Uh we even have more going on, do we not, Phil? Oh, you know it, Rye. This week we are also going to be going eye for an eye on Longshot. And we have a review of some movie called Avengers Endgame. Right? Avengers Endgame. And for the second time, Matt, we will walk into the Cinema Jaw Spoiler Lounge I'm excited. after the episode. So we're going to do two reviews of it, if you will, Jawheads. We'll do one at the beginning that'll skirt around all those spoilers. But we figure about half the population has seen the movie this weekend. So at this point, when you're listening to this podcast, after the credits roll, some spoiler talk. Yeah. I like, I like that choice of words, half the population with the snap and mm -hmm. everything. You like it? Yeah, those good plan words. Uh, since we're going eye for an eye on the movie Long Shot, which stars Seth Rogen and Charlize Theron, I thought this is a good time, Matt, for you to take Pat McDonald on in Seth Rogen, Charlize Theron movie trivia. Wow, crazy. Oh, boy. So we got a jam-packed jaw here. As and always. Not to mention, Matt, it is uh, still Stephen King month. So let's start there. Phil, do you have a Stephen King fact for us? Yeah, I do. This week, in honor of Stephen King Month, Cinema Jaws fact is on the movie It. The number 27 is often associated with this story. This second film was released 27 years after the original 1990 television miniseries. In the book, it's mentioned that It, or Pennywise, returns to Derry approximately every 27 years. Jonathan Brandis, who played young Bill in the original film, died at age 27. The movie was released one month after Bill Skarsgård, a.k.a. Pennywise's, 27th birthday, Jaden Martell, who played Bill, Jeremy Ray Taylor, who plays Ben, and Nicholas Hamilton, who plays Henry, are all 27 years younger than the actors who portrayed the same characters in the miniseries. Jonathan Brandis as Bill, Brandon Kane as Ben, and Jared Blancard as Henry. The official U.S. release date is 9-8-2017. 9 plus 8 plus 2 plus 0 plus 1 plus 7 equals 27. And the second film will be released on 9-6-2019. And 9 plus 6 plus 2 plus 0 plus 1 plus 9 is also 27. Wow. That's weird. A lot of 27 going on. Yeah. Jim Carrey was in the wrong movie. Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, speaking of Stephen King and Pennywise and everything, I was just thinking, like, uh, he was a good villain and all, but you know, 
I think with Avengers, they have made Thanos the best movie villain ever. You're joking. No. I, I, come on, Matt. Best Marvel movie? No, 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 no. Or the, what? The, <laughs> Hold on. Uh, there's a, I just want to get a, this right. There's a, there's a capital letter Let and a period. Capital letter, period, at the end of each word. The best movie villain ever. What? Come on. No way, Matt. The, I mean, in cinema history? I this am is saying ins- he is, is the best movie villain ever. Oh, man. Cinema, cinema war. war. You're going down. Okay. I don't think so. <laughs> this we'll is see. such an easy one. Yeah, all right. I don't even have to write an argument for this. Well, well you God. probably didn't. Pat McDonald, uh, he is a film critic here. You can read his stuff over at Hollywood Chicago, one of the places. That's right. Just among just among one of them. Yes. Uh, you can also hear him on WGN Radio, yes. WSSR FM. Yes. And Am Joliet, I right Joliet, 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 Jake, Illinois. Somewhere yes. up in Monroe, Wisconsin, I believe. Yes. It's WBGR, if I have yes. those call letters right. Uh, WGBO. And I don't know who thought it was a good idea to put Pat on TV, but he's also been on <laughs> Fox 32, WGN TV, and 190 North, all here in Chicago. Pat McDonald, welcome back to Cinema Job. Blessings, you guys. It's great to be back, Rye and Matt. Gosh. And, and we, long, were, we were just reminiscing. Uh, the last time I was on the show, we were at Mother's. Oh. So how long were you at Mother's? I don't know, a good five years. Yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. we started there. That, that was right. definitely where we, we've stayed for a, quite a long time. Yeah. Five years, four, four or five years. Then we moved up to my office. There was a, a Rise House era, but we've been here now for about two years. This mm-hmm. is great. It this is. is fantastic, man. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that means a lot because, Pat, as I mentioned, you've been going around. You do WGN radio. You go I, to these places, and this is a pretty nice studio. You like to sit in a comfortable place when you're talking. This is a very comfortable place. Uh, congratulations. It's just a great uh, atmosphere to have this kind of uh, conversation. Not to mention there's a man in a... a a, a unitard out front with an American flag cape. Yes. I think they're doing That's some sort of wrestling That's how I knew I was in the show. right place. Yeah. <laughs> That's how you know, Pat. I thought you were referring to your water cooler for a second there, but uh, okay. Guy in the <laughs> did you see him? The guy? I did. Yeah. I did. I, I, so I, and, you know, you opened that door. I walked in. It was like walking into Oz. Yeah. Some perfect. people think we might be joking. This was something <laughs> no, that no, actually it really act, Actually out there, folks. It's awesome. Uh, so, Pat, you've been a film critic for uh, quite some time. Yeah, now. 10 years. Over 10 years I, how now. have you seen it change for, in, through those years when, when you first became an accredited right. film critic to now? Well, what you have know, you seen change in the industry? Mostly, mostly the number of people who are doing it. Um, I mean, I think it was still relatively innocent when I started in 2008. Uh, the day I walked into the screening room for the first time and saw Roger Ebert sitting there, and I said, oh my gosh. So I, the lights go down. Afterward, I went over to him and I said, the only reason I'm here is because you're here. Because that's, that, that's what summed up my whole life, you know, as a kid growing up watching Siskel and Ebert and uh, admiring Roger Ebert uh, from afar. And then to actually sit in the same room with him, quite a big thing until he passed away, of course. So, but... Um, but yes, definitely, you know, there was an innocence to it uh, in 2008, as I said, that is not, now it's just very vast. The, yeah, the, it's uh, diffuse. Yeah, it's diffuse and, and vast. <clears throat> and I think it's a good thing in a sense, but, you know, it's going to, the wheat's going to separate from the chaff, as they say. And uh, cream rises. We'll see what happened. The cream rises. Thank yeah. you, brother. Yeah, I mean, to give That's you an exactly idea, it. the uh, screening that we went to for the Avengers was yes. <laughs> closed. To give you an idea, it was closed for media only. And, and it, it was filled still full. up the entire Every seat AMC was full. theater that we were at. Yes, the, the theater was packed yeah. with. Nothing but press. Yeah. So it has grown quite a bit that people don't want to cover these movies. <laughs> um, the other thing that you're still doing, and I mentioned at the top, yes. is this film tour here in Chicago. Yes, 10 seasons on that, too. Let's, I mean, this is I'm great. I'm so old. Because, because we have a lot of awesome history in this city when yes, it comes to cinema. And it's nice to know that people can come from out of town or the suburbs or even the city and get on a tour and somebody as knowledgeable as yourself and as good looking as yourself you. gets to take them around <laughs> town and give them a tour of all these famous locales. Well, it, it, it has been a privilege in a sense because I still love it. I, I still love the reaction that people have. I still get a thrill seeing certain elements in the city that are part of the Chicago movie heritage. Basically, the bus has video on it. We show the clip, then we show the location. It, and it, it just... 
it just uh, gets me that we have so much. We're so rich in this town. What's okay? So in the ten years since you've been back on yes. Cinema or, or seven or eight or however long it's been, <laughs> what's your favorite new location that's come out? Well, you know, this this is a very... And, and don't tell us it's from Jupiter Ascending. <laughs> Although we do have some Jupiter Ascending <laughs> on. The Lake Street Bridge blows up, man. Okay. It's a good one. <laughs> Uh, you know, I always poll people to say, how many people have seen Jupiter Ascending? And, you know, maybe one timidly, that movie was bad, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. So anyway, um, this, is a, this is a really great story. Uh, it was probably about year three or four. And um, I was doing some research uh, for a new Blues Brothers tour that we were, we were adding. By the way, shut down by Universal. And... Um, uh, and I realized that on the tour were a couple of warehouses. And, and between these two warehouses is where the Bluesmobile went on their way to the orphanage. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and the um, alley doesn't exist anymore. The two buildings do. And the two buildings have a rich history, too. The old Schoenhofen Brewery, which opened in Chicago in 1862, wow. closed during Prohibition in 1929. And when the Blues Brothers drove through there in 1979, they were two ugly warehouses. And now... They're upscale condos. Wow. So it, it's almost the history of Chicago right at that corner. And when I discovered that, it was like Nirvana. And I love bringing people there. I love it because it's so cool. Does it still look anything like the scene in the film? Or is it completely transformed? It's completely transformed. They, In fact, they have blocked off the alley with a fence. And the alley is now gone in a sense because the warehouses or whatever was behind it have been since torn down. Mm. Because that's very highly redeveloped with the housing there now. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. But you get to see the clip and then you're, yes. you're looking at it. So yes, and then you're seeing the Blues Mobile go right between <laughs> it and then you're seeing those buildings and right between where they're going in. When we did the Blues Brothers tour, we went right up to it. You know, we got to get on this bus, Pat. You we have should. to. We, you, we really should this summer. Seriously, guys. Honestly. Uh, yeah, my treat. So. What about, do, okay. do you do where the, uh, they flip the tanker uh, not the tanker, but the big semi truck in the Dark Knight. Which Absolutely, takes place on LaSalle. Lower Lower Wacker. Yeah, yeah. but I, oh, on Lower Wacker, but and then they come yeah. up that ramp on right, LaSalle. Right, right, yeah. right. But oh yeah, good, good uh, Dark Knight stuff in there. And then, in fact, a lot of people come on the tour just for the Dark Knight stuff. Yeah, I would imagine. Uh, and also a little a little known fact: Australians love the Blues Brothers. Have you ever heard this? No. no. Melbourne uh, showed the Blues Brothers for thirty five straight years. From the minute it opened till 35 years later, when they finally said they were, it was like Rocky Horror Picture. They only show it during the weekends, but for 35 straight years, just had this cult following. Blues Brother, it had I a think we have huge some Australian followers. We got some Australian Listeners. jawheads. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Definitely well, cool. Movie. Yeah, well, yeah. You guys, I mean, seriously, if you're out there, I know you're. I know you love the Blues Brothers like the Germans love. David Hasselhoff. Yeah, that's so <laughs> odd it. where things will catch on, right? Yes, it's, I mean... Like and, Cinema John Australia. <laughs> and, when, and when these Australians would take the Blues Brothers tour, it was like... Oh, they were, they were in, in, they were in, in awe. Awe. You can't see me, but I'm shaking. Ah, you know, I mean, they couldn't believe it. Because we went up to Ray's Music Exchange, which is intact on 47th Street. Yeah. I mean, crazy. It's awesome. That's another religious place. I mean, it's just like you're, so how you're often at Ray's this, Music How often does this tour go out? Just on the weekends? Yes, yeah, so we go on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, either 1030 or 1230, depending on when we get the most people. We'll always go out once a day on those two days. So either 1030 or 1230, Saturday. Saturday or Sunday during the summer. Awesome. So what a great job, man. Definitely. It if, is fun. <laughs> if, if they want to find out more or buy tickets, mm. is there a website to do so, Pat? Yes, yes, yes. ChicagoFilmTour.com. That's a good one to have right it'll there. Give you, it'll give you the phone number. The phone number is the easiest way to, to make a reservation, but we are on Viator, and we do take reservations through ChicagoFilmTour.com. If they want to read your reviews, best place to send yes. them is over to Hollywood Chicago? HollywoodChicago.com. That's right. I do a few uh, contributions to the radio station. I work for, but primarily Hollywood, Chicago. That's where my Avengers review is. Awesome. Nice. What about Twitter too? You're on. You're on yes, the tweets. Yes, at Uber Critic. 
I like that. How you know, did he get Uber crew? You know what's know. funny? It, this is a funny story. Uh, my 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 wife said when I just started this out, she goes, "You should brand yourself. You should find something." This was what? How? This was two thousand and eight. When did you know, Uber yeah. come into the marketplace? Twitter, maybe three yeah. or four la- years later. So I said we came up with Uber Critic. Okay, and I'm like, oh, cool. That's just so stupid. It's perfect. So that's how I've been labeling my stuff. And then Uber comes out. Oh, you copy from them. That's what people say. Well, or maybe you're critiquing Uber, like Uber drivers. <laughs> exactly. That was the, that's the other thing. Exactly. <laughs> oh, he was God. nice, but he smelled a little. <laughs> yeah, they're afraid when you get into their cars. Oh, shit, it's the Uber critic. <laughs> <laughs> get the get the. Uh, He's been wondering why he gets such nice service the, from all the Uber get the, drivers. Get the air freshener out. Get the His air freshener Uber out. Critic. The Uber critic Pat, is here. Honestly, before you said that, I didn't <laughs> even think funny. of it. Seriously, Too funny. that's and that, it's hilarious. It is. That would actually, I'm sure that exists. I I'm sure it. there is somebody critiquing Uber drivers uh, out there. There must be. We like to end all of our guest interviews with a silly cinema cue, Pat. Get to know the guest <laughs> uh, a little bit better. Phil, you got something for for Pat. Uh, yeah, Pat. So mm-hmm. I did have a, a, an original question, but the name Uber Critic really uh, made me inspired. So I changed it up a little bit. Uh, obviously, uh, it's Stephen King month, as we talked about. Yes. And uh, it's it's Endgame week. So the Avengers yes. are on everybody's mind. Mm-hmm. Got me thinking, uh, who would be the worst? Which of these two would be the worst Uber pool partner you could have? Rocket <laughs> Raccoon or Cujo? <laughs> and why? So, so he's in an Uber carpool, and he's got yeah. one of these two. With yeah, him. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, do, doesn't Cujo drool <laughs> drool a lot? Well, he's a rabid Saint Bernard. Yes, yes. yes. So there, he, there's there's things excreting from. Yeah, him. there's some foaming at the mouth. I happening. mean, Rocket would be great. He'd be kind of smarmy. He would make fun of the Uber driver. <laughs> make fun of where you're going. I'm gonna have to go with Cujo. Would be the worst. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, that's yeah, because of the. You know what he secretes. No, I agree. <laughs> I know. I would actually like to be in the car with Rocket. <laughs> yes, <too>. exactly. <laughs> He'd be entertaining. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Good stuff. All right. Nice so, one. Pat Uber yes, critic yes. McDonald <laughs> is sitting in on this entire job. He has his summer movie preview. That's, I do. He has his end game review. Yes. A lot going on here. So let's keep it rolling, Phil. Eye for an eye. Yes, eye for an eye. Long shot. When Fred Flairsky reunites with his first crush one of the most influential women in the world, Charlotte Field, he charms her. As she prepares to make a run for the presidency, Charlotte hires Fred as her speechwriter in The Sparks Fly. The film stars Charlize Theron and Seth Rogen. It is directed by Jonathan Levine, who previously directed Snatched, Warm Bodies, and 50-50. Rye, what you got? Full disclosure, I caught an earlier screening than normal for these movies, so I already have seen Longshot, but... This is Eye for an Eye. Would I be interested or ignored going to see this movie with Seth Rogen and Charlize Theron paired together? Hell yeah. I mean, Charlize <laughs> is... I, I can't believe her range. I've commented on this before, that you can totally buy her as badass in something like Atomic Blonde or Mad Max. She can do dramedy like she just did in Tully, and she can be hilarious like I've seen her in Longshot, Interested. Yeah, totally. Matt? First of all, I agree with your fandom of Charlize Theron. I think she is, pound for pound, one of the best leading ladies going in, in cinema today. She's great. Seth Rogen, I'm always down. He's, he's one of the best comedic minds. Interested. This looks like a fun movie. Pat? Well, um... Uh, Tully was one of my favorite films last year. I just thought that was an amazingly underrated film. I agree with you. Yeah, it uh, made my top ten. So I'm I'm down with Charlize. Uh, this interesting story about Seth. My late brother, who uh, passed last year, did not like Seth Rogen. He demanded his money back from every Seth Rogen movie he ever saw, <laughs> and he swear if he ever saw him on the street, ooh. But anyway, I I thought to myself after I did also. See See the movie that Steve, your Seth Rogen thing is now to put. This is definitely something I'm recommending. Phil, well, uh, it's hard, right? You guys are kind of turning me. Uh, on paper, I feel like I really like this idea. I have seen the trailer, uh, and maybe it's just the 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 trailer house didn't do a great job of high. But like, I just felt like the joke didn't land. I didn't really get what was going on. Um, 
Oh, geez, this is tough. This younger I'll generation. Have to go, I'll have to go interested just because you guys turned me, but just yes. by a hair. We're doing our, our, our due diligence, Woo. aren't we, Pat? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> for Youngsters. interested for a long shot. Awesome. We can already say we'll have a review since I've already seen it next week for yeah. the Jawheads. Sound cool. good? Sounds good to me. Speaking of reviews, and uh, the reason why we're not doing two reviews, Matt, we have a juggernaut here. We do. Back in the year 2008... A movie yeah. called Iron Man, starring Robert Downey Jr., of all people, smashed into the theaters and launched the MCU. Now, 11 <laughs> years and 22 movies later, we have reached the end game. Is this the end of the MCU? No. But is it closure to this amazing era of films Marvel has strung together? Yes. How do we get closure when the last time we left the Avengers team, half of them and half the universe had been killed off by Thanos? Well, Matt and I and Pat and half the world headed to the theater to find out how. Even if there's a small chance, we owe this to everyone who's not in this room to try. We will. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Last week on the show, we covered our top five MCU moments. And I'm glad we did it, as it was an appropriate trip through time to get me ready for Endgame. The film starts in a somber mood. We finally get an answer to where Hawkeye was when Thanos snapped his fingers. Hawkeye survives the snapping, but like many others, his loved ones did not. The Avengers that remain, Captain America, Black Widow, Thor, are now joined by Captain Marvel and come up with a plan. Track Thanos down recapture the stones, and reverse what has been done. Wow, at this speed, the flick's going to be done in about 30 minutes. Not so fast. Thanos used the stones again, but this time he used them to destroy them. Now what has been done can never be done again. Great Scott. <laughs> We're holding major spoilers until we get to the Cinema Jaw spoiler lounge, but we will give away this plot line. The only way to bring back the vanished is to figure out a way to travel back in time to when the stones existed. Harness their power and reverse the snap. As I mentioned at the top, this collection of films goes back 11 years, so there is so much ample opportunity here for Anthony and Joe Russo to pay some fan service, touch some nostalgia moments, and ultimately give us an intriguing time travel story. And for the most part, it all worked. This leads to a climactic battle that was the battle of all battles, the one we've been waiting for. In many ways, the last few Marvel films just keep raising the stakes of how many superheroes they can fit on the screen at the same time. I felt this was a satisfying ending. Not being a Marvel fan, I'm going to be honest, I did not get emotional throughout any part of the movie, but I bet most fans did or will. I also must note the Russo brothers did a great job of gesturing to the new Marvel characters that their time to shine is still ahead of them, all the while paying homage to the heroes that kicked this thing off. Matt, I liked it, but didn't love it, so I turn it to you, Mr. Marvel, mm. your I, thoughts on Endgame. Well, first of all, I don't know if I'm worthy of the uh, title Mr. Marvel, but thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> I actually had something prepared here, but I was kind of thinking you were going to go meh on this. So mine was kind of a rebuttal to that. Um, I mean, he here's the general thrust of this. I, I, I think that Avengers Endgame is a singularly unique film in so many ways, not the least of which is the fact that it is the culmination of 11 years of intense buildup, which is an impossibly high bar that many franchises have failed to hurdle. Star Wars, The Matrix, even Indiana Jones, just to name a few, didn't get over the jump. But Endgame delivers, and it delivers huge. 
And I think it's fair at this point to say the Avengers saga is the greatest pop culture movie franchise of all time. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in absolutes this week because it's true. <laughs> and like I said, Mr. Marvel. Here's another this thing. Is great. Everyone is in this movie. And I mean, everyone is in this movie. <laughs> Natalie Portman. Check. Check. Tilda Swinton. Check. check. Michelle Pfeiffer. Michael Douglas. Robert oh. Redford. Check check, 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 check. I mean, the Russos delivered a fully packed picnic basket of emotions, payoffs, comeuppances, Easter eggs, jokes, storytelling. They knocked this thing out of the park. I didn't know a movie could be made like this. You loved it. I loved it. Pat, your initial thoughts. Well, <laughs> how do you follow that? <laughs> well, I got uh, one more point. Can okay, I, yeah, uh, go okay, ahead, all right, I'm sorry. This, this is something I had written down. If summer blockbusters were the Olympics, then Marvel Studios would be Michael Phelps at this point. Wow. I mean, right? Yes. I agree totally. As in they're with smoking your dope? Is that what you mean? <laughs> I hope so. You have to smoke dope to see the movies. No. Um, I gave it four and a half out of five on my review. I agree. I love the film. I, I, and I agree with your assessment. That is, I will say one of the greatest pop culture uh, cinema phenomena. I put Dark Knight up there too. But uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is a great and memorable experience. And you know, it's, it really is about the relationships. And, and here's what Marvel does better than DC by a mile. They establish relationships, they get the right actor to play the right part, and they make those relationships work on camera. So this is, it's filled with every superhero you can imagine in the, in the Marvel Universe, and yet it still works. Yeah. We go back to the first Avengers where they were kind of awkward with all those characters, and it was funny that, you know, in that time travel paradox that you're seeing some of the former things happening you know sure. again that may be a maybe a bit of a spoiler but um i just said I, you know what i compared it to gone with the wind this is the gone with the wind of epic superhero movies that is a great comparison exactly why scarlet scarlet o'hara wasn't <laughs> And and I and, and in my review I kind of paid homage to uh, Chris Evans and Robert Downey Jr. It is their personalities the personalities that they developed through those two heroes that is the driver of the film and when you have a driver like that you know you everybody can get on the bus and everything's fine yep four out of five, four point five out of five a Marvel uh, must see as they say okay really quick the runtime any issue with it at all for None. you None. Pat? Me None. neither. I, I, a lot of people were asking, I, I think because this is, you know, a, a, a pop culture movie, they usually don't go this long. So I well, think you got the, the film, Lord of the Rings and stuff. Yeah, true. But that was I don't sci-fi. I think it never went three. Slightly different. It's a fantasy, not sci-fi. But going along, I mean, the Marvel movies are almost identical in, in, in lengths of time. A lot of movies at They're the time. They're 220, yeah, usually. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's about as what we're going to go at. So everybody was making a big deal about it, but I, I felt... It, it, nothing. I thought, yeah, normal movie to me. Nor- that normal movie to me. And yeah. I think they needed that length to, to fill in as much as they did. Well, how about, you know, we always have that uh, shaky hand to look what time it is on our, our uh, devices. Our yeah. devices. And uh, I never felt that for a second. Same. I mean, Didn't have to pee either. No, exactly. It's, it's a psychological thing, man. I was in it every single frame. It now, I mentioned I wasn't emotionally moved. Uh, Matt, you uh, had a little bit different of a... Story. Yeah. And again, so this is not the spoiler lounge. I'm not going to tell you what moved me, but there is a moment in the film mm-hmm. uh, that that made me cry. And, and not just a little bit. I was sitting next to another grown man blubbering as if I were a child. I mean, mm-hmm. I lost it. And, and tears were streaming down my face like it was the end of E.T. Well, my brother was the one that introduced me to comics and... When you talk about the whole half, you know, the population er eradicated uh, by Thanos, uh, and then you realize what that loss means, you know, very, very emotional for me, very difficult to even watch. Yeah. So. 
for sure. Yeah. Um, the, the moment actually that got me that isn't too big of a spoiler, so I'll say it here and not in the, in the spoiler lounge, but where I did feel a, a good flutter of emotion was a moment where all the women of the Marvel uh, Universe yes. actually have a moment yes. inside this humongous yes. battle moment, but they paused for a second to say, we got her back. You know this moment, Pat? Yes. What a great, it was only three seconds, yeah. four seconds yeah. long. But it hit me. I was like, God, great for them. Thumbs up that they took the time to, to you, highlight that. You know, to their credit, that, that, that moment didn't even um, impress itself upon me as being different. Like, it was just like, here are a bunch of heroes doing right. heroic things. I wasn't like, oh, this is the, the female moment. Like, I didn't notice that. And I think that's to their credit. And But it was a tremendous snapshot. It really it was. was. It, was a, it was an obvious, like, take. And we're all kind of frozen in the moment with it. And then we're going, yeah. Exactly. I liked it. There were also a couple of nods. I, I mean, obviously, there, there's a moment of uh, dialogue by Robert Downey Jr., uh, Mr. Iron Man, Tony Stark. But it, it plays uh, both hands where it's, it's talking about the characters in the movie. But the dialogue is also um, can be looked at like what this Marvel creation did for all the fandom that it created he talks about all the people that it joined together and the new people it discovered very easy to translate that to not just what is taking place on screen but what was taking place off the screen Behind with the us scenes. fans and i thought that was well done by them i i completely agree that was a really nice meta moment in one of the more meta <laughs> stories uh, i guess it's fair to say of all time at this point oh man Matt, and his, he's all time with well, this. I mean, this is, you know, it is an all timer. It really is. This is, and it's an unprecedented thing. We've never seen a film or a film franchise like this before. It's unique. Yes. Well, you know, you were talking about the uh, cinematic universe that began in May of 2008. My gosh, 11 years ago and 22 films. And it's, and it's cut into phases because when I was on the radio this morning, I was talking about the phases. And when you go over that, you're just like, what a brilliant piece of storytelling. That's what I've been saying to this guy yes. here for so long. Pat, the entire yeah, time we've been good. doing Cinema Jaw, I've, yeah. I've finally only just now put a dent in his armor. <laughs> I think it's significant dent. Yeah, he was the one that brought up the, uh, the, the, the women superheroes. Yeah, I was sure. like, that was a nice take. And, 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 you know, that was a real moment it for really me. Was. And I, I love that you, you, you mentioned it really seriously. There's so many things to mention. I'm there sure, yeah. you know, spoiler uh, we're, we're, lounge. Yeah. We can, and we'll we're going to bring it down more. just a little bit further here. A best moment or scene for you, Matt Kay, uh, without so, uh, Yeah. I, I don't know if this is a, a spoiler. Let's just say that, that, Thor's appearance changes. Uh, when, when, when they go to meet him, he's hanging out with his old buddies uh, that he met in Ragnarok, Korg, and I forget the guy with knives for hands, Doug, right? Throw it in the fish tank. Fish tank does. Does. Okay. <laughs> doesn't matter. It's, it's Taika Waititi doing the voice of Korg, and, and they're playing video games, and it's ridiculous. Uh, that scene was amazing. I love it. Uh, for me, and, and we will hit on this in the spoiler lounge, but there's a very climactic moment with uh, Black Widow and Hawkeye on screen mm -hmm. that I think if, if there was any tense moment, it was this moment for, I, I think, probably everybody, me included. And again, we'll talk about that further later on. Well, um, just like any situation where a lot of people die, memorials pop up. And in this case, it was a garden in uh, San Francisco, and there was some sort of uh, search for a name. So, you know, uh, again, when you lose somebody like my brother who inspired me in the comic book world and you see those monuments up, it's almost like at his, his, I have a little voodoo altar to him near my uh, work desk and I want to get one of those stones and put his name on it yeah. because that's what it means. Yeah. That's what it means. Beautiful. Nice. It, in fact, it, I got my little notebook here and there it is written down there. The vanished monument I wrote down. It, it struck me too, Pat. Well done. Um, Worst or any problematic issues with the film? I got one. I got one, man. This is this is not a movie I will say is perfect. Um, so they they look for a big brain, okay? And this is this is kind of difficult to talk about without spoiling something. But I'm just going to say that that Hulk is different in this movie, okay? And and he's not exactly Hulk, and he's not exactly Banner. And I think that that was way underdeveloped. They didn't really differentiate this new persona we meet uh, from, from what we've seen before enough. Like, 
is it just Banner? No, it's not just Banner. It's it's something new, and I think that that was underdone. And it was almost played for laughs more than anything yeah. else in the entire. They might have needed a whole movie on that one. I Seriously. agree. Yeah, yeah I, I that that's He's, a... it's a third thing. It's not Banner, yeah, and it's not Hulk. Exactly. And, and Thank you. They, yeah, they messed yeah. that up a little bit. Yeah. My my moment was the battle sequence. I, I Unfortunately, I thought it was a bit overwrought. Uh, although it had very many exciting moments in it, I just, I get a little nuts with the CGI. Me too. You know, when they're they're creating creature after creature after creature. And I don't and even know are, what the creatures are. I have they, no idea. They're, they're, they're flying. Tari. They're flying. They have, you know, they're steel. They're, you know, there's little, little mites running. <laughs> it just, yeah. And not only that, because because what they do they're cannon is, fodder. is they're able exactly. they're able to give you these like fan service moments that everybody's going to cheer with, but the actual battle scene itself, outside of having like the main objective of what they're trying to do, is a complete mess. It just cuts of like <laughs> explosions and this and this and all of a sudden this guy does this and this. But what's going on, really? I don't even. You know. can be in the biggest screen in America, and you're just like, what is it's going? Too much. It's too much. Here and that sort of leans into mine, my issue with this. And and this is I, I think something that I've had an issue with for the entire time with the Marvel movies. As an outsider looking in, I still feel they're not playing with what I call uh like the rules of the superhero um reality, if you will. And that, and, and by that I mean this. I honestly, to this day, have no idea what actually will harm them, kill them, <laughs> or what won't. And there are times, it literally makes no sense to me. In, in this movie, an entire bomb is basically dropped on a, a person that I, of, of what I still think is, he's a normal person. He just has a suit on that can alter him, but nothing happens. No, nothing happens to him. It, I, I literally don't even get what how people can take this that serious then. Okay, a bomb just dropped on the guy, and he's the guy that saves the day. What? I, okay, and then there's other moments where sometimes somebody gets stabbed with something, and it's like, oh, he'll never walk again. No, he just takes that right out of his body, and he can fight anybody. But then somebody else falls off, you know, somewhere here, and it's like, oh, he's dead. That killed him? Jeez. Just dropped a nuclear bomb on the other guy, and he just stepped away and, you know, skipped. I, I honestly, I, there, it, there is something off here. Am I right a little bit, Pat? Yeah. <laughs> That is really, I, 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 you know, I don't even think about that. But right, I, when I was growing up, I knew all the DC powers. I knew them all. But Marvel, eh, you know, what, what do they really have exactly? You know, they keep it vague on great. purpose so they can, they can tailor the powers and weaknesses to the story at hand. And their angst and philosophies. Yeah, which is more important, arguably. But it I, is, it is, it is. I would say that I noticed some of the uh, communication issues that you've had in the past where characters who are miles apart or at least in different parts of a very 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 large battlefield can instantly communicate with one another <laughs> with no apparent captain america does captain does go with have it. an earpiece it. but nobody else does <laughs> yep so ryan you you turn me on to that fact and it's true yeah and, and one oh more you guys pet are peeve, deep one more pet peeve and i almost hate giving this one out because it'll bother everybody else the rest of the way and i've talked about this too they they have to have the fact that the, the heroes take off the mask to say important lines all the time. And this literally has, uh, there's about three in a row where literally uh, uh, Spider-Man or whoever it'll be literally does something, takes off the mask for a quick second to say, I got it, blah, 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 and then puts the mask on and swings away and somebody else does the same exact thing. And I'm like, why are they taking their mask off? And once you start... That's in your head. It drives me nuts because they do it almost all the time. They Especially since off. they can just talk to each other whether or not yeah, they're even matter. in the same room. It's, it's ridiculous. Well, they're like uh, hockey players who have to get into a fight, so they have to take off their helmets <laughs> so they know who they are. <laughs> Good times. All right. Influences here. What do you got? You got to influence, Matt. This one's tough, man. It too, it's too meta to have any influences. I think it's influenced by itself. I think I nailed it here. Are you ready for this one? This is if Back to the Future 2 mixed with Return of the King. Epic time It's actually good. I think you did get it, right? I'm trying to think of a, 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 a apparent relationship movie because uh, to me this is a, a, a very big relationship movie. So, I don't know, Goodbye Girl meets... <laughs> <laughs> 
um, <laughs> meets uh, Transformers. <laughs> I don't, don't know. know if I know, agree with the Transformers <laughs> thing, but yes, I see where I was you're going trying for. to go, bombast. you know, at bombast exactly. So, but you know, I I think uh, ultimately uh, this was a, a a great relationship film, and and that's uh, really what struck me and brought me my warm fuzzies. Mm-hmm. What'd you learn here, Matt Kay? What did I learn? I think we all learned what a shared movie universe can be. This is so unique; it is unparalleled. Mm. I learned I need to research the powers of the Marvel superheroes because that was a excellent point, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I learned that Thor can like beer and video games when properly exposed to them. Oh, he's always liked beer. Yeah. Yes. I just That's like it. New. It was but like it's, video games. Yeah. I love that it was a typical roommate house. Yeah. You know, garbage all over the place. These guys beer are and playing pizza. video games. Yeah. Beer and pizza. Movie poster quote. I got two. Ooh, I got two. Oh, geez. The cherry on top of a masterpiece Sunday. That's the first one. The second one is, how will they top this? And that's an actual question. Oh, I thought that was about the Sunday also. No, how will they top this? Gotcha. I don't know. I don't know if it can be topped. Okay, I, I went with see it really big and then underneath it and then let's move on. <laughs> Enough. A, All right, I'm, I'm with you here, man. I'm giving you a good review here. Is that I'm, why you, I'm, I'm ready to move on. Is that why you like it because it's the last one? No. Because it's not just... I know, know. there's okay. going to be more. Pat, do you got a movie post? Yes, I do. Uh, the universe will be universal. I like it. That's the best one. I mean, why has he got to be so much smarter than us, you know? Yeah, and not class that hard. off like that, I tell you. <laughs> All right, we're swinging it around. On here, Pat, we're a yes. four-jaw scale. On a four-jaw scale, how many jaws, Matt? Five. Um, <laughs> I'm giving it a four. Two and a half. Get the hell out of here. Come three. On. All right, three, John. Three. three. Only That's three? It. Three at most. Three at most. You're That's such it. a jackass. You just spent I the last it. 15 minutes glowing but over I this. But I gave you other reasons. And when we get to the spoiler lounge, I have a few more issues. I got, I got one that I brought on Matt that we're going to talk about. Oh, I can't wait. Okay. <laughs> because I brought that up and it did bother you. He texted me hey. when he got home. I've been thinking about that the whole ride home. All right, more talk on the Avengers, Matt, when we get to the Cinema Jaw Spoiler Lounge. All I'm right? looking forward to it. I can't yeah. wait to talk about all those spoilers. Until then, though, it, the Avengers Endgame isn't the only movie coming out this summer. Right. There are a host of big movies coming out. So we decided here, it's a good time to do our movie special, our yeah. summer movie special. Woo-hoo. Uh, Pat, we're going to kick it off like this. Yeah. We're going to go three, two, and one. So you're going to yep. give us your th- third most anticipated yes. film, so forth. And then at the end, we'll do a hidden gem. Perfect. Number three, what do you got sitting there? I got number three, Rocket Man. You know, this... Uh, the Elton John movie? Yes, yeah. the Elton John movie. Uh, this, this old 1970s boy got, uh, got Bohemian Rhapsody last year. And this year, I'm getting Rocket Man. And uh, Elton John, of course, uh, probably the Beatles of the 70s, in the sense that every album, which came out every six months, had three or four huge hits on it. The album from beginning to end is great, just like the Beatles did. And I think they're going to make this sort of a fantasy. They're going to they're going to show uh, uh, Teron Edgerton playing Elton um, and uh, Jamie Bell playing Bernie Taupin, his uh, lyricist. And it's going to kind of fuse them together and bring the, bring us through the highs and lows of Mr. Elton John's I'm, journey. I am a little worried about this one. I, I, I'm hoping for the best because I'm an Elton John fan. Yep. But a lot of times when you get when you get a smash like you did Bohemian Rhapsody and you get that follow up kind of film right where everybody's like, "Ooh, that's a great idea. Let's get you know." Yeah, yeah. An Elton John bio one up on there. Hope for the best. Okay. But a little worried. A little worried. I kind of agree. And I also don't know how great Bohemian Rhapsody is. Is it not a little overrated, being honest? Yes, it is. 100%. Okay. But, um, you know, I think this is a generational thing, quite <laughs> frankly. <laughs> I'm, I'm an Elton John, John fan. Everybody's too. an Elton John fan, in a true, sense. True. When you went through the actual stuff. <laughs> All right. I'm an old man. Well, we're not far behind, buddy. All right. Swinging it around to my number three. And guys, I got to be honest. I am stoked for Godzilla, King of Monsters. 
cannot oh, wait. You're joking. I'm wow. not joking. Oh, all right. Wowza, wowza. Really? This wowza? is going to be a junker. Oh, my God. You guys, yeah. you're forgetting how soon we forget. Just a few years ago. Gosh, I mean, what is it? Three, four Throw years? it in the fish tank. Throw it in the fish tank. Uh, everybody was like, Godzilla, whatever. Yeah. And then the movie it came out. Amazing. We were like, whoa, that yeah. was awesome. And and here we are. It's going to happen again. And and I just can't wait for Gamera, Mothra, the, the things I grew up <laughs> with when I was a little kid. I loved it. I'm ready. May That's 31st. Awesome. Here's what I'll say about uh, the new Godzilla movie. I can't keep it straight now. Is this a sequel to the reboot? Yes. I mean, there's so many levels now. I'm going on. Right. Uh, you know, when we remake, a, uh, when we take a familiar title, and make it again. So this there we go. This is actually a prequel to the Matthew Broderick version. <laughs> there you go. So could be. You don't even Amazing. know what's going on anymore. Uh, my number three pick. I'm always interested in uh, directors' sophomore outings. So we just had last year Annihilation, Alex Garwin's follow up, right? Mm -hmm. And I was excited for that. Now this time on July 3rd, we have uh, Ari Aster who directed Hereditary. His sophomore film is called Midsummer. It's spelled M I D S O M M A R. Mm -hmm. And just reading the scoop is uh, a horror film about a utopian summer festival couldn't be uh, better timed. The sophomore feature from Hereditary Director is set in a small Swedish village where the local culture is not as wholesome as it seems. It's supposed to be Wicker Man meets Jonestown kind of vibe. Very different from Hereditary, but terrifying nonetheless. I'm in. Big I'm time. in too. <laughs> Can't wait for it. Hereditary was one in my top ten. There that we was go. Just a, oh, yeah. a piece of a masterpiece. A I piece agree. Of Although the the uh, ending, I felt anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about Pat? What do you got sitting there? Yeah, what do you got there, uh, Pat? What do I have at number two? Uh, once upon a time in Hollywood. Wow, wow. Yeah. Number two. What could top this? Well, well, there's something that does, and again, <laughs> generational. But um, I, uh, once upon a time in Hollywood. I think uh, is, is it on everybody's list? Yeah, th this was my. Number I left one. it off. Me, in, in a little behind the scenes, uh, we, we decided not to cross over. Yeah, yeah I, I understand that, and I knew that you know there would be some copy. But I think, you know, my number one's different from everybody else's. But just to discuss this again, a generational thing set in 1969, a pivotal year for Los Angeles, the day the music died in a sense when uh, Manson came in and slaughtered the innocents uh, at the, uh, in the, that track housing, uh, Sharon Tate, Jay Sebring, et cetera. And uh, it's a background uh, film. Uh, they, they presuppose a guy who can't get a break after coming out of Westerns, uh, the Leo Dica DiNardo, uh, DiCaprio, Leo DiNardo DiCaprio, uh, <laughs> he's playing a Burt Reynolds type character, and uh, he's a neighbor of Sharon Tate, and we see all the, you know, what swirls around uh, is uh, going on with uh, Once Upon a Time. Um, I like Dakota Fanning, it's Squeaky From. Uh, yeah, listen to this you know, cast. I mean, the cast is Brad amazing. Brad Pitt, Margot amazing. Robbie. As uh, Sharon Tate. Uh, yes. Uh, Timothy Oliphant, Michael Madsen, which is a regular, Tim Roth, a regular. Yeah. Uh, and then you got Emil Hirsch, and let's not forget the late Luke Perry, his last film credit. Uh, did we mention this is a Quentin Tarantino film? Quentin yes. Tarantino. Did we we did not that? mention that. Oh, we didn't? No. I thought Pat said that right no. at the top. I, I don't, I don't, maybe I said it. I, I don't, don't know, know if I did. Unbelievable. But I, I mean, um, I'm always pumped for a Tarantino. And then yes. you get this cast. And the subject matter, yeah. which I don't know probably enough about. I mean, I know. Did you it, read Helter Skelter? But I haven't read Helter Skelter. Oh, okay. And so I'm interested to find out, you know, more of the details. So here's the Pumped. thing. Here's uh, I agree, guys. Uh, anytime Tarantino makes a film, I think everybody gets excited. But uh, what about the glut of of Sharon Tate and Michael um, <laughs> and, and uh, Manson films that are coming out now? There's, well, a ton, they, there's at least three or four. Is he the first one to, to get I, into the... To the uh, who, what else is coming out? I, I they heard. may be coming out because of Tarantino. I think that's fair okay. to say. But he's right. not going to be the first to theaters. There's uh, The Haunting of Sharon Tate, which kind yeah. of a B-movie. And then there's an, an, another one I just saw today with some notable actors in it. So 
It's, okay. it's sort of a Manson well, revival. Well, it's the 50th anniversary of the murders, so it makes sense. It does make sense. So we, we what do you got sitting at too, Matt? Uh, guys, I'm going to go to the exact opposite end of the <laughs> spectrum here and highlight a movie that's coming out I think is going to be a big surprise, Detective Pikachu. Wow. What? I am stoked. What? <laughs> I think it's going to be You're so much fun. You're making a joke of this list. I'm not making Come a joke. Come on. <laughs> Godzilla and then Pikachu. You are summer. You, you should be Miss Summer right now because <laughs> these are summer films. These are the yeah. great summer films. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this why wouldn't it? This isn't a joke. Detective Pikachu is going to be a left field <laughs> hit. Wait and see. I'm telling you, you're going to see it and you're going to be sitting here at that desk and you're going to be like, you know what, man? I liked it. I thought I wouldn't like it, but I did and it was great. All right. Let's move on. And Pat will agree. <laughs> I got well, nothing. I, I'm I got nothing. I don't even think it's going to be a left field hit. I think it's going to be a hit hit. <laughs> so there you go. Um, for the record, after that pick, let's throw this into the fish tank. <laughs> Phil's most anticipated film in the uh, oh, there's summer a, season. There's a, there's a Pixar coming out. So uh, and what he thinks of the, your Pikachu pick, right. because he's more of an expert, Matt. My number two pick is only produced by Guillermo del Toro, but I think his name being attached to this movie is excitement enough. And I never read the books. And I, I, I say shame on my fourth grade self. I'm speaking of scary stories to tell in the dark. Yeah. yeah. Very intriguing. Again, I'm, again, I would have picked that, Rye, but... I know. am so excited for this one. It comes oh. out August 9th, so the beginning of August. Yeah. And... I, just the premise of the the idea and the title alone is fantastic. There's even a documentary about the phenomenon of yes. the 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 movies the and the books. I yeah, should say, yeah. scary stories in the dark. So, did you guys see the doc yet? I have not watched it. Have you? Yeah, you did. Yeah, good. it's good. All you right. watched it also? No, I have not seen no. it. It's good. Um, I'm, I'm excited for. All of it. What's I, the name of the doc? It's just called Scary Stories. There you go. Not the, not the best title, perhaps. Yeah. I, I, I only wish that it was Guillermo del Toro directing and not producing. But hey, we got some del Toro mixed in here. He put so. his name on it. That means something. It does. It really does. All right. Your most anticipated film this summer, Pat. I, I don't know what's bigger call, than Once call Upon a Time me, in Hollywood. Call me Mr. Sap. But when, that, when this um, trailer came out, I, it, it freaking blew me away. The film is yesterday. Now I'm a, I, you know, I'm an old timey Beatles second generation fan. Was alive when all four of them were alive and knew about it. But anyway, the point is, um, the, the, it, it's just an amazing premise to me that that the Beatles music goes away except for one guy, and how do you use that gift and bring it into the universe? Amazing, I think amazing premise. Danny yeah. Boyle, eh? But <laughs> but amazing premise. Are you saying Danny, Danny Boyle, eh? eh? Yeah, he, Danny he, Boyle can do some good stuff, and I think he's a, he's good for this. I he is good for this, but I I just I, I kind of feel like. Sometimes he grabs stories and strangles them too much. You know, that's all I'm saying. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think I would have liked somebody younger and fresher, you know, but, but as, as far as age appropriate and, and, and trying to get the, the, the zeitgeist and, of the Beatles, and, and Danny just, Boyle's perfect. And let me just say this, because I'm sure there's jawheads out there that may not have seen the trailer or know exactly what the premise of this movie is, but the idea is that uh, the, the guy... What, does he hit his head? I forget the exact premise. But in a nutshell, he wakes up in a in a world that no one's heard the Beatles right. other than him. Other than him, right. So he knows all the songs and can sing all the songs. And he happens to be a musician. Right. right. And so he can play them. And everybody's like, oh, my God. When did you write that? But yeah. nobody else has. It's yeah. pretty awesome. It is, it's, it's such an awesome premise. It might be screwed up. Who knows? But I'm, I'm anticipating that like no other. Hmm. That's a good one, man. All right. Uh, at number one... I am really happy that uh, Keanu Reeves will finally get the oh the trilogy. I can't wow. This. wow! The trilogy. He's that, making a joke of this list. It's, it's, it's official. amazing. It's official. The trilogy that he deserves. It, it was not the Matrix, guys. And and let's be honest, it was not Bill and Ted. Okay. John Wick Parabellum is coming out May seventeenth, and it is my. Most anticipated summer movie. Wow. Year. I mean, what am I missing? Tell me what you got at number one, because no. this is... Uh, John Wick... <laughs> uh, 
I mean, there, the there, first one was good. And there's the a Spider-Man bl- movie, and Matt loves Spider-Man, but you missed on that. You'd rather see Pikachu. You know, here's the That's thing. Fine. It, it'll, I'm glad you brought that up, because after Endgame, I, I don't know. Like, right. I'm not as excited for a Marvel movie for a little while. I, I just... Maybe give it a let little it breathe. breather. Okay, yeah, let it breathe. Yeah. No, I'm excited for point. John Wick Chapter 3. I do want to see it. I think uh, number two actually made it into something way bigger than just what the first right, one like, was. Like, seriously, so it's, guys. It's grown. The it's hotel, grown. the right. suit, everything. Like, he's got his own little, like, story. <laughs> Full honesty, Pat stole my number one, which was um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But I'm glad that he did because it lets me cast another vote for... June 14th's dropping of The Dead Won't Die, directed by Jim Jarmusch, and uh, it it has got Adam Driver, Bill Murray, Tilda Swinton, a host of people, actually. It's one of these large cast movies, and seeing the trailer, you got these zombies uh, apocalypse going on, and yet you got people that almost look like they're in a Wes Anderson movie. Yeah. walking around yeah. and that's what it reminded me of uh, maybe almost a little bit too much it almost reminded me of there's the ticket a Wes Anderson zombie movie Can I, and not a Jim Jarmusch I, I don't mean to interrupt I'm go just ahead. I'm no, very I'm very excited about this too Jim Jarmusch okay um, Only Lovers Left Alive amazing yeah Dead Man one of my favorite movies yeah. of all time I love this guy okay to tell me that he's making a zombie movie which is one of my favorite genres and it's got Bill Murray and, and Adam Driver and Tilda and all those people you just mentioned. My interest is peaked. And then I saw the trailer and I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it is. It, it's like way too precious He's and hot. slow. It looks dumb. I got to be honest. That trailer did not do it justice. And if it plays out like that... I think it's going to suck. Wow. Well, he's coming up Patterson, which was in my top 10 two years ago. Oh. Uh, love that movie. And I think he's a difficult guy to do a trailer for, quite frankly. That could be. I'm you hoping know, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, this, to me, again, a great choice because it's a can't miss uh, for me. Same. Coming off Patterson. That's mm-hmm. all I'm saying. Because I, I think Driver and he together, a new team, a new new great director-actor combo. Well, him so and Tilda. bring it home and him and Tilda. All right. And now on yes, to those hidden today. gems that we promised the Jawheads. Something that might not be on everybody's radar, Pat, but yeah. should be. What do you got? Well, this was a, this was a toughie because there were two of them. So I, I'm, I'm just going to be fair and, and say one. The Last Black Men in San Francisco. Big buzz out of Sundance for this one. And also a very interesting premise about that city itself. We, you know, we were talking about San Francisco earlier with uh, the Avengers. And um, they, they've really priced everybody out except the richest people. And, it, and, you know, the richest people happen to be of a melatonin level that's decidedly white. So, I mean, this is all about how the culture of San Francisco has changed because of the money and how um, this, this last black man in San Francisco is going to uh, kind of be the symbol for all of it. So I'm looking forward to that one. I, I, I think that one, uh, because of its sun dad's buzz, really intrigues me. Hmm. I'm interested too. Same here. Um, Jennifer Kent is putting out uh, another movie this year. She famously directed The Babadook which ah. is a movie near and dear to my heart. I would uh, go ahead and call it a, a horror classic at this point, maybe a cult classic. Very nice. Uh, the Nightingale is coming out uh, August 2nd, and I am absolutely stoked. Seems to be a little, little less horror, still some horror elements, uh, maybe a bit more drama, but uh, I'm in. I love when this happens. I wrote down two hidden gems, and one of them was The Nightingale. So yeah, nice. it's Both one. get mentioned here. Matt mentioned The Nightingale. I will go with uh, one that sounds absolutely awesome. It is, it is called Blinded by the Light. Yes, that also was my other one. Of, yeah? Awesome. There we go. Yes. Getting a lot of uh, buzz over at, uh, from Sundance. Comes out August 14th. And the idea here is that uh, we're, we're mixing Bollywood with Bruce Springsteen music. So um, a, a young man um, by the name of Javed, I, Jarvid, I don't know, it's J-A-V-E-D is the character's name, Javid. Uh, finds an escape Javid. from his surroundings through the soaring sounds of the boss's 1980s glory days. Mm. What a premise. I haven't, yeah. even, I haven't even really seen a full trailer for this. I remember no. just seeing on Twitter, following along with Sundance, and seeing the buzz for this film and the premise, and thought... I'm in. 
So have you guys have you guys ever sat down and watched like a like a Bollywood hit movie? I've seen maybe uh, there's a famous one set at a wedding. I can't think of the name of it right now, but it was more of a takeoff of the style rather than the style itself. Like I don't think I've seen a true Bollywood film. You? No. Okay, do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and would you recommend one? Uh, like a title? Yes. Yeah, I can't because okay. the one that I watched uh, was obviously subtitled. It was on YouTube and it was old, but it's more about the style. Like the the musical numbers and everything else, it's kind of a throwback to the old Hollywood. Really, it's 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 a bygone uh, genre that that has been <laughs> since revived. It's uh, it's interesting. Well, I always find too that it's amazing that that film industry is out there, that it exists. And it's huge, and it's huge, and and it's a whole other culture of cinema that. You know, hey, let's get let's get in, indulging in that now. You know, I agree. It's great that, that a movie like this is is shining it's the light. It's also great that no one mentioned the Lion King. Congratulations, guys! <laughs> or Aladdin. Aladdin. Or Aladdin. Yeah. Aladdin. None of that. Uh, two if, this year. We're getting two lives. Yes. Uh, if this wasn't enough preview, uh, when we come back, Phil's also going to mention his most anticipated summer film. Plus, we have a cinema war about Thanos. I can't believe we have that. Plus trivia, Pat versus Matt K. We got a lot more going on. Stick with us. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. In honor of Cinema Jaws Stephen King Month, we celebrate Andy Dufresne's escape with this iconic clip. In 1966, Andy Dufresne escaped from Shawshank Prison. All they found of him was a muddy set of prison clothes, a bar of soap, and an old rock hammer, damn near worn down to the nub. I remember thinking it would take a man 600 years to tunnel through the wall with it. Old Andy did it in less than 20. Oh, Andy loved geology. I imagine it appealed to his meticulous nature. An ice age here, million years of mountain building there. Geology is the study of pressure and time. That's all it takes, really. Pressure and time. That and a big goddamn poster. To get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. And we are back on Cinema Jaw, hanging out with Pat McDonald, writer over at Hollywood Chicago. It's been a long time that you've been over at Hollywood Chicago. I have been there for a long time. I did. I have done other uh, venues uh, over the years, but that's been my main base. Also being part of the Chicago Film Critics Association. Yes. We have a big festival coming up that the yes, Chicago Film Critics Association puts on. It's taking place again at the Music Box Theater, May 17th through the 23rd. And uh, we always do talk about it here because it's such a special event that the idea that these critics actually go out to the different festivals, your Sundances, your Toronto's. Your and, cons. Yeah. And <laughs> it, you, you go out there and you guys actually handpick these movies and bring them all to Chicago for their premieres. Well, when you say use guys. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, here, here's, what, here's my biggest plug about the Critics Festival is that uh, you don't get an opportunity to go to Sundance. You get, don't get an opportunity to go to uh, uh, Tell You Ride, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we have people who do get to go to those, and they bring back the creme de la creme. So basically what you're seeing is what's happened in the first quarter of 2019 for the big buzz movies that will most likely end up on Oscar shortlists. Yeah, I agree. Perfectly said. And, and that's that's historically proven. Yes, right. it, um, it is. We, we do our top 10 every year with uh, Brian Tallarico. Mm -hmm. And he even commented, he's like, four or five of these movies that are on my top 10 were at the Chicago Film Critics Festival. And Quite it, remarkable. It's just, it's just because they're bringing in such great films. So if you're in the Midwest, you're in Chicago, yeah. through May 17th through the 23rd, 
come on out. Uh, I can't recommend it enough. And not only do you get to see the films, but many times there's talent, be it uh, a director, a producer, actor, actress in the movie that comes out and does a, a special Q&A after. And not to mention the fabulous music box theater. Oh, uh, a gem. A Chicago gem. It really is. Yes. Uh, before we get to trivia and before we get to Cinema War, we did throw a couple items into the jaw box, and I promised the Jawheads Phil's summer pick, too. Let's open up that fish tank. Wait a moment. It's fish, isn't it? DC, play fuck, play fuck. No, Pat, it's a giant glass bowl. Hey, get some fish, folks. Who's coming with me besides Flipper? Here. That's a second message. That means Luca Brasi sleeps with the fishes. You're going to need a bigger boat. Hey guys, uh, thank you for letting me out this week. Uh, so I have a lot of things to say uh, about. Uh, I'll get to that anyway. Uh, let me start with the questions first. Um, so our first one: What was the what's the name of the bug guy with the um, knife hands in in the MCU? I think I'm saying it right. It's it's Meek, right? Yeah, it sounds right. There you go, Meek. 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 I think yeah. it's it's hard. It's spelled weird. I don't really. Anyways, uh, that's his name. Uh, when did the last Godzilla movie come out? Matt had thrown that one in. The last American one was 2014, which mm. is the the prequel to King of the Monsters. I will point out real quick, Godzilla's a woman. Why is it a king? Is, is Godzilla's female? I yes, Godzilla's a female. A uh, Godzilla. I, so it, <laughs> Godzilla has babies. Of course it's a female. Hey, but, but when did Godzilla, this Godzilla have babies? I mean, I don't know, but... <laughs> So, right, I guess that's like, uh, like, uh, maybe they gender swapped it, but historically that's not what Godzilla is. All right. It should be I'm queen of the monsters. I'm flabbergasted by this news. Yes. Godzilla this has is, always been a can woman. We, can we just say monarch of it's the like monsters? A, you we could say alliteration like, and everything's happy. Unless you take it into like Yoshi territory where it's like, I guess a boy, well, who knows, hmm. but... <clears throat> Anyways, uh, then the last question that we had in here uh, was, what is my most anticipated summer movie? Uh, and, and it's a two-parter, and what do I think of Detective Pikachu? Uh, I'll start with my most anticipated. I, my most anticipated is actually scary stories to tell in the dark. Uh, unfortunately, it's not Toy Story. I, I think here's what... Pixar sequels are great. I love Pixar. I'm going to see Toy Story, of course. I want like another Wally or something, right? And I don't mean that in like a Wally too. I want like something that I just didn't expect. I think that's True. when they do their best. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't think I can add anything about scary stories to tell in the dark other than that, right? I read them as a kid, uh, and it, even like the, the 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 cover of the book, you know, induces, scares me, induces and, nightmares. Yeah, yes. and so just I, I'm excited. I'm very excited for that film because oh. it's a very big part of my childhood. Uh, now onto another very big part of my childhood, a very big part of my adulthood, quite frankly. Well, uh, your childhood is a very big part of your adulthood. Yeah. Well, uh, like an active thing that like literally there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about Pokemon. That's just a fact, right? I, you guys might remember back when we were at Matt K's office, um, I, w I would I would level grind my Pokemon uh, during recordings. Uh, we, we did not know this, Phil. Oh, well, maybe I was doing a good job hiding it. You're speaking another language for me and Pat. I know I, Pat, you don't know what he's talking about either, right? Okay, at least me and you don't know what he's talking about. I love Pokemon so, so much. I'm going to see Detective Pikachu probably like four times. I, I will. <laughs> I'm probably going to like it, but that does not mean it's going to be good. <laughs> good. <laughs> like, Thank you, Phil. Thank you. It's, right, it's going to be great. I, I I buy every single game that they make, right? And for those who don't know, every every time a Pokemon game is released, it's in pairs, right? There's like you know red version and blue version, and they're basically the same game, but there's slight differences, really minor differences. You get them both. I buy them both. Wow. I buy I pre-order. I buy them both. <laughs> Uh, right? Like, I, 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 the thing that I always say is that Pokemon is my ABCs, right? I think I knew Pokemon, wow. the first 150 Pokemon, before I knew the alphabet. I, I, it's such an important so part of my Pokemon childhood. there's more Pokemon than Pikachu. There's more. <sighs> <laughs> All right, we'll end it there. We'll end it there. We'll end it there. <laughs> this is, I mean, Phil, I feel your pain, man. Yeah, I do. <laughs> well, he's see, both be... of you are painting me because Detective Pikachu is not going to be good. Let's throw right. that out. It's right. not going to be good. I think it's going to be great. As a Pokemon fan, as someone who, <laughs> on a, right, I'm going to, I future throw my money. War. Future Cinema War. <laughs> it, uh, anyway, yeah, uh, it's, it's uh, not going to be good. It's it's both great. of you are like, both of you are giving me grays. It's going to be, it's going to be the Deadpool of the Pokemon <laughs> universe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
All right. Sure. <laughs> Was that everything? Filled? Yeah, that's all we all got. Right, jump back in that fish tank. Will do. Amazing. Matt, it brings us to a segment called Cinema War. The war, it works like this. Me and Matt were battling on a topic. Our guest, Pat McDonald, is playing judge and jury and telling the Jawheads at home who he thinks won the Cinema War. It's important because we're battling for jaw time to rant and rave on whatever we want. Matt, you said something ridiculous about Thanos. Uh, Phil, what's today's Cinema War topic? Today's Cinema War topic. Has Marvel created the best movie? Yes, movie, not Marvel, but movie villain of all time with Thanos. Matt, you're going to be fighting for yes, absolutely. Rye, you're saying, Matt, you're out of your mind. Let wow. this Infinity Cinema War begin. Ryan... Balance must be restored to the Cinema Jaw universe. When we talk about what makes a great villain, it's this. Physical menace, relentless pursuit of evil goals, and the brains to actually pull it off. No one has more of these three things than the mad titan Thanos. He is the best movie villain of all time. <laughs> Hold your horses here, Matt. <laughs> Matt K., I tell you, your Marvel fandom has clouded your judgment. Thanos, best movie villain ever what what he's not even the best marvel villain since i'm not the biggest fan i pulled up a google search to get other names so that i could uh, fight you with here in sure, marvel sure. yeah i knew you okay. would do this go ahead go so i i typed in best marvel villain collider website was the first article i pulled up and so i clicked on it they have thanos listed seventh okay <laughs> They have Loki number one, and they also have uh, villains that are much better, as in Killmonger, Vulture, Ego, and Red Skull. All much better than Thanos. Okay, Red Skull, <laughs> no way. Loki is not a villain they anymore. They listed it. They listed he's, it. He's a hero now. Okay, look, I can name a slew of villains, but I think we all agree, ready, that Darth Vader topped this list before, right? Both... Thanos and Vader are twisted father figures. Both are powerful, but Thanos ekes this one out, ekes out the win. Vader was redeemable, just like Loki. Vader was also not the big bad the Emperor was. We all knew Vader was would be a good guy in the end. Thanos is unwavering. He is in command, and he wins against the good guys. He is more villainous than Darth Vader. Okay, I was just at C2E2, the big Comic-Con here. <laughs> Crazy super fans galore. They love to dress up as everything and everyone, including Darth Vader, who you just mentioned, Matt. How many people were dressed up like Thanos? None. <laughs> it's a tough cosplay, right? You're None. basing your argument on a cosplay. Oh, you should see the cosplay at these events. That does not count, Matt. I've seen Vader everything. is easy as hell. No, I've seen every cosplay mm -hmm. at this mm -hmm. thing. It's also everything. been around. Also, Vader's been around for 35 All years. Right. I've seen everything imaginable, and and why? Because nothing is very memorable about uh, uh, memorable about him. Great villains have some 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 type of weapon, a famous line, or they uh, breathe heavy. Thin has nothing. Are you shitting me? No, he has I'm no, not. He's, he's no memorable. weapon. He's got the infinity so gauntlet. No swearing. He's got the infinity <laughs> gauntlet. Okay, one thing that makes a great villain, like Killmonger, for example, is when we can see their side of the equation. Thanos is not evil from his point of view. His idea of balance is horrible. It's a horrible galactic genocide, but what he he's doing what he thinks is right, and he will not stop. It, interestingly, that's also the main question quality of a hero. Thanos is the hero in his own mind and that's what makes him so interesting. Okay, I don't want to just stick to Marvel here because you <laughs> did say best movie villain ever. Yeah. So I, I did a search Who you here. got? Who you All got? Right? AFI, American Film Institute, did top movie villains not long ago. Here's just the top five. Yeah, but before Endgame. Just top five. <laughs> Hannibal Lecter, Norman Bates, Darth Vader, Wicked Witch of the West, Nurse Ratchet. Oh my God. <laughs> Thanos, not in this league at all, Matt K. His performance was not deep enough, it was not complicated enough, and it was not, I should say, as much as I liked Brolin's performance, it just wasn't strong enough compared to those performances to say best movie villain of all time. Wicked Witch of the West. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, she's scary and all, but really? Come on. Another thing to be considered, honestly, is the Joker, right? That's, that's the yes. elephant in the room. Uh, both guys like purple and murder. 
But the Joker's mythos is too cloudy. And and honestly, same with all those other characters, too. Is he a gangster? Is he an anarchist? Is he a failed comedian? He's whatever, I guess, he is. And, and he is a great villain. But Thanos is not a mystery. He is what he is. He's tall, dark, and deadly. And I think I could punch out the Joker. But I would poop in my pants if I met Thanos in a dark alley. All right, I'll leave you with this, guys. Another knock I have against Thanos is he is CGI. I don't believe in him. <laughs> Thus, I don't truly believe in his actions. Thus, I do not truly, uh, I, I should say, I'm not truly scared of him. Did it work in the world he was set in? Sure. But did he provide a menacing presence that transcends the Marvel films and becomes his own horror like the great villains I'm mentioned have? No. Thanos does not crack the top 100 in my book, let alone the best of all time. Put down your infinity pipe, Matt. Your eyes are as red as Red Skull's head. Red Skull. Whatever, man. We are buttonheads here as we do each and every week. We throw it to Pat. What did you think of this cinema war? Well, here's here's the problem I have with it. You 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 simply put him as the greatest villain in in cinema history. I'm writing down things like Norman Bates, the No Country for Old Men, the Javier oh, Bardem sugar, character, yeah. uh, Doctor Jekyll, Mister <laughs> Hyde. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and Joker, he fell into a vat of acid. That's his origin. He's that's not. <laughs> not. We're gonna get a Joaquin Phoenix one that's gonna be completely different. <laughs> And, and his skin turned white, his <laughs> lips turned all right. But anyway, I, I unfortunately the, your your premise was a little too broad for me. I'm going to go with Mister. Thank you, thank you. Ride the music uh, movie, movie guy, guy. or on. music guy too. <laughs> Ride the movie guy. Thank you. I actually told Matt uh, what a joke of a, a idea that you would think that. I don't think it's a joke. All right. What do you got, Ryan? Too that, broad. Hey, earns me just uh, quick seconds. I'll just say this. Uh, speaking of Marvel and Brie Larson, part of the Marvel Universe, small movie out on Netflix, Unicorn Store. Okay. With Brie Larson and Samuel L. Jackson. Mm. Worth checking out. Very whimsical. Also directed by Brie Larson. Wow. Interesting. And it's Very good. streaming right now on Netflix. Did they shoot it synonymously with no, Captain Marvel? No, <laughs> she, no it, it took place actually before. The story is uh, it played either at like South By um, a couple of years earlier and then was looking for distribution. And Netflix bought it and was sort of holding on to it, what to do with it. And they released it sort of in conjunction now that it's pretty Larson Mania out there. So Very cool. Unicorn Store. Yeah, well, nice, and they make a nice good I, I recommend. Yeah. Have, you, have you guys watched um, The Man in the High Castle? No. Only. The first season. I've, I've read I did the, watch the first season. I gave up on it. Okay. Well, book. that that will be my hidden gem. I'm in the midst of it right now, and only because you know, again, growing up in the '60s and '70s, you know the World War II guys. So when you get inured in that whole World War II thing again, that what if the Nazis and the Japanese had won? It's just like. The atmosphere they create in that, uh, I, I really have to give a thumbs up to. But I would understand, too, that someone would have a hard time getting through it because it's very, very specific as to what the subject matter is. But mm. I'm going to give that as my hidden, hidden uh, gem. Gin gem. Wow. All right. Nice. I like it. Brings us to the end here, and we want to play some trivia. We always like to All go right. out with some fun trivia. As we went eye for an eye on Long Shot, which stars Charlize Theron and Seth Rogen, we're playing... Charlie Theron, Seth Rogen trivia. Pat, you're our guest. Yes. You get to choose. If you want to go first, let Matt go first. There's steals, and if you get hung up on a question, you get one trip into the fish tank for Phil, me, and Phil. All right. So you get one trip. One into, trip. All right. I like that. I'm, I'm writing down Pat all the literally rules writing here. That down the rules. <laughs> okay. So I will let uh, the, the, the venerable Mr. Matt K wow. go first. He defers to Matt K. Matt, question number one. In 2007, Seth Rogen knocked up this actress in the comedy, Knocked Up. Um, that was not Charlie Theron. It, it, not even close. Oh, man, I'm blanking on her name. May I steal? You will, you well, will once get he gets it wrong. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Catherine Heigl. Wow. Oh, you saw it. <laughs> I Whoa. didn't think you were going to get it. Wow. <laughs> One to nothing, Matt K. Question two yes. over to Pat. Pat, in 2012, Seth Rogen teamed up with 
Barbara Streisand, who he knocked up all, no, I'm sorry, um, for this road trip comedy, name the movie. Oh. Seth Rogen and Barbara Streisand. Did you see this one, Pat? Yes, I did. <laughs> Smother mother. God darn it. It was a better title, you want to, steal to be it? honest. Matt, you got a chance for a steal. Um, I, I, it's not throw mama from the train. <laughs> it's got it's, another underrated. It's got show. mama in it. Wait, wait, wait. Give me, give me a chance here. It's um, I don't know. I forget. The guilt trip. Ah, damn it! <laughs> the guilt trip. One to nothing, Matt K. Question three. Not a good movie, by the way. (laughs) Question three bounces over to Matt. Matt, Charlize Theron starred in A Million Ways to Die in the West. What actor played the lead in the film, Albert? Oh, that was, um, that was, uh, (laughs) dude, I'm just having one of those nights where I can't remember names. (sighs) Five seconds. No, 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 no. You, yeah, what's it? We're going long. <laughs> We're going long here. We got a kid. Got to time it. Hey, down he here. can he can edit. Four this seconds. is radio. Um, Seth MacFarlane. Damn you! Yes. <laughs> I, I like, just I just like to keep the suspense you high. <laughs> It's two here to nothing. Come, here comes K. the hard I question. I swear I'm not faking either. Wow. Very good. They're coming to be late. Excellent. Two to nothing, Matt K. Question four over to Pat. Let's make it a ball game here, Pat. What was the name of the 2009 movie that starred Seth Rogen, Adam Sandler, Jonah Hill, and Leslie Mann? It was about stand-up comedians. Funny people. He is on the board. It is two to one. Question five. They keep getting harder here as they go down. Question five to Matt. Charlize Theron has starred in one movie with Tobey Maguire. It came out in 1998. Name it. Was she in Pleasantville? Mm. That was my guess. Incorrect. It bounces over to Pat. Charlize Theron has starred in one movie with Tobey Maguire. It came out in 1998. Name it. And you do have a lifeline if you want to go in at question five. I'm going to use that lifeline. Wow. Into the fish tank we go. Phil, what was the name of that Charlize Theron, Tobey Maguire movie? All right, Pat, your clue this week. <clears throat> As I sip on my apple juice, let me tell you, this clue rules. Rules. Now I know it. Oh, damn. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm drawing blank. Cider house rules? The oh. cider house rules. What a clue from Phil. Great, went, great clue. Went I, don't great point, I don't get no, a point for that, though. you don't. You don't. It's still two to one. Yeah. Question six is over to Pat. Pat, Charlize Theron only appeared in one movie with Tom Hanks. It came out in 1996. Name it. Oh, you doing that thing you do. <laughs> two to two. He ties it up. <laughs> In a singing, a singing answer. Two to two, question seven over to Matt. Seth Rogen has starred in one movie with Michael Fassbender. It came out in 2015. Name it. I'm going to jump in the fish tank wow. here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in the fish tank we go. I have no idea. Seth Rogen, Michael Fassbender in the same movie. What was it, Phil? Alrighty, Matt, your clue this week. Not an Android guy. Not an Android. Oh, holy crap. How did I miss this? Um, Steve Jobs. Another great clue from Phil. Nice, yeah. Nice good clue. good movie. Decent. Uh, yeah. I like Let it. me cut this, uh, set the stage here. It's three to two. Last question of the game. Over to Patty. Can tie it up. Come on, Pat. Here we go. Both lifelines have been used. Pat, in the 2011 film Young Adult, Charlize Theron bonds with an old classmate named Matt Freehoff. What comedian slash actor played him? Young Adult. 
What was the year of the film? 2011. 2011. It was a comedian slash actor who starred alongside Charlize Theron or Theron. Draw on a blank, my friend. Matt, you got anything? I don't know if you would know this one. I, I, I have not seen Young Adult, but can I venture a guess? Go ahead. 2011, comedian, actor. Was it, was it Louis C.K.? Patton Oswald. Okay. Patton hey, I wasn't Oswald. that far off. He's in the same orbit. Matt does win this one. Three to two. Can I get a handshake? Yes. <laughs> Especially those those last minute. Wow. Come tough up ones. With a, tough beautiful, ones. beautiful, beautiful uh, hey, stuff, and man. If it came down to a tie, a jawbreaker, this question would have been over to Pat. Who wins in an arm wrestling match? Charlize Theron or Seth Rogen? Gee, I have to go with Theron because... Yeah, me too. I, I think he's right on that. <laughs> I want to say one other thing, too. In the original Japanese film, Godzilla and all the other monsters are referred to with gender-neutral pronouns equivalent to it. Um, and in the English dub versions, he's a male. He has legs through, uh, excuse me, legs, e eggs through parthenogenesis, <laughs> which is non-fertilization. Nice. Eggs. Well done, Pat. That's what, wow. thank you, Wikipedia. He just, he just fish tanked the fish tank. He did, he did. Unbelievable. Fish tank the fish I stand tank. by. Whoa. Men don't lay eggs. Has anyone in this room laid an egg? <laughs> well, well, we'll talk about that later. Uh, comedically, hey, yes. Ryan just admitted he laid an egg, and let's not forget that. Hey. <laughs> now that you mention it, Phil. The real jawbreaker was this. We got to go really quick. Age of Michael Fassbender, closest to Matt? 48. Pat? Um, I'll, I'll go 46. Give that one to Pat. What? 42, 42. Wow, really? Wow. Yeah. wow. He, he does play older. <laughs> Brings us to the end of a great cinema job. First and foremost, we got to thank our guest, Pat McDonald. This has been a blast. A real, real pleasure. I hope I don't have to wait another six years. <laughs> I know. Yeah, definitely not. Buddy. Thank you, brother. We'll have you back. Thank awesome. You, we also got to thank the man behind the glass over yes, there, sir. our engineer, Phil Me and Phil. Uh, always happy to help. Always happy to help. A uh, real quick shout out, too, because I'm sure he's listening. Uh, thank you, and we love you, and we miss you, to Corbin. Yeah. Oh, well done, Our man. intern. Our intern. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we got to thank our sponsors. Yes, Matt thanks Kay. to Overcast and the Chicago Podcast Co-op, who help us get great sponsors like them. If you would like to support Cinema Jaw, the easiest way to do so is leave us a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And while you're at it, click subscribe. It's only one extra click, and it really helps us out a ton. Reminder, Jawheads, uh, we're going to say goodbye right now, but after the music plays, we are stepping into the Cinema Jaw Spoiler Lounge, where we will talk all things Avengers, uh, assuming you guys have seen that movie, so stick with us if you have. Until next week, I'm Rai the Movie Guy. I'm Matt Kay. And, and keep, keep on jawing about, about the movies. movies. This is a warning. You have entered the Cinema Jaw Spoiler Lounge. Plot details, character deaths, twist endings, and everything in between will be discussed. Only continue forward if you have seen the movie in discussion, or do not care if something is spoiled for you. Again, this is a warning. All right, Jawheads, we are in the Cinema Jaw Spoiler Lounge. Very comfy here. This is where we... Talk about movies with spoilers, and this week, obviously, we are spoiling <laughs> Avengers Endgame. So this oh is your God. last warning. We are going to be doing spoilers here. A special shout out to our editor, Phil, who has yet yeah. to see Endgame and is sacrificing gonna... himself, just like Black Widow did at the... <laughs> Uh, what is that place called? The, the... I guess we'll start there. Yeah, yeah, let's just start there. All right, so Black Widow's death, I alluded to it earlier in the podcast when yes. I said that Black Widow and Hawkeye's scene, and this is the scene where they have to go get the soul stone, and of right. course somebody has to die. Which we know, but they're so right. enthusiastic to be going on this like buddy adventure together. And then when they get there, yeah. we have that same issue where someone has to give up their life 
to to retrieve, uh, to the, retrieve soul. the soul stone. Wow, what a what a scene! Yes, it was amazingly done. I talk about your cliffhangers, <laughs> but I will say I would have, I would have rather had Hawkeye go. I, I think have. maybe we all would have. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest. I I'm love sure it. there's some Hawkeye fans out there. I'm one of them. Yeah. But, but as far as the MCU goes, I'm way more invested in um, in Black Widow. I mean, Scarlett Johansson's been in way more of the films, and she's just a, a kind, of, kind of a better character. Let's be honest. I was just talking about who was sadder. Hawkeye was sadder in the movie. He needed to go. <laughs> he, had, he had nothing to live for. But he did because they were undoing the snap so ostensibly his family would be back, right? He right. says, tell my family I love them. <laughs> no, you've got to live. You've got little children. And, and I think the way it, they, they cut this whole thing together, because mm -hmm. I, I love when there's moments where it's like, it's her. No, it's him. No, it's her. No, it's him. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was beautiful. Like, okay, it is her. No, it's yeah. him. <laughs> no, it's her. They did that. It's so perfect. It was amazing. I, I couldn't it believe it. It truly was amazing. It was like the only time I was super peaked up in my chair. I'm like, what? Yeah, <gasps> yeah. And yeah. ended up being Black Widow. And dude, did you guys not like get kind of like sad when you see Black Widow's body. mangled body? Yes. Ugh. They didn't cut away from that, did they? They did not. They showed it. They did. And uh, again, I think the rating on this is probably PG. Mm -hmm. um, so 13. The PG-13. Yeah. So they can't go too close to it. But there, that was sort of, you know, a little bit sad and gruesome. All right. The other big death. Let's tackle it here. Thanos. Well, I'm kidding. Well, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Iron Man himself. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was sort of a did, contractual obligation. Yeah, yes. did, did, I think most people <laughs> saw this one coming. Yeah. If, if anybody thought there was going to be an Avenger that died, people had their money on Tony Iron Stark. Man. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I guess I'll turn it to you, Mr. Marvel. This is did, the moment. Did you think this was yeah. was satisfying? So the the moment I was talking about in our review section uh, that made me cry was the death of mm. Tony Stark. Mm. It it just broke me down. I, d I don't know what it was. Like, maybe because they've set him up as this father figure to uh, Peter Parker, who I feel some s sort of connection to. I sort of saw him as a father figure myself. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm armchair analyzing this, but <laughs> it made me cry. Yeah, they did it really well. I will say they lingered upon him after his death a little too long. I, I feel like he passes and then the camera hangs on him and they didn't need that. A I don't know. It was, it was maybe a little morbid at that point. <laughs> he was starting to decompose. <laughs> I mean, right? He's just sitting there with his eyes open. It's like, come on, cut away. Like, it was enough. But... But yeah, I mean, and Pepper's there and everything. Yeah. It, was, it was tight. It was, it was a tough moment. Also moved by this one, Pat. Um, yes. I, I, oh, I are was, you leaving? I was because I, I really do honor uh, Downey Jr.'s performance as much as anything. I, he has entertained me with that character for since 2008. And, and the first Iron Man, of course, is a classic. Um, I, I'll go to a tearjerker moment for me, and we're going back, we're going to go deep into the time uh, travel that they did. They went back to 1970, and Downey Jr. got to meet Howard Stark. Tony yes. Stark got to meet Howard Stark, played by the great John Slattery. Right, I didn't like this and, bit. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I didn't. I just thought it was really a reconciliation to his angst about his father. He, he saw him as who he was, which was a dad, because he had become a dad. Another spoiler alert. <laughs> he become, uh, Tony Stark had since become a dad since the reckoning, and when everybody was killed, he actually brought life into the world. And to understand that life and life and life is coming up between two fathers is quite extraordinary. And I, it's, it's not almost a, a tear-jerking moment as much as a reckoning and a reconciliation for the great Tony Stark character. I agree. He needed that moment. The character's yeah. arc needed that moment, right? You had a problem with this. Yeah, I had said, I, I think they could have done it a lot quicker. It, to me, it felt like he lingered talking to his father, um, and it was the same type of beat, that same uh, reconciling with multiple times, three, four times with the conversation. <laughs> like, yep, we got it. Oh, this is something. Okay, we got it again. You know what? Hit me over the head just one more time so that I feel 
that he's talking to his dad and he's going to be a dad. Yep, I got it. All right, now you can go. <laughs> Could have done it a little bit graceful and, and had like a, you know, that kind of moment in Field of Dreams where all it needed was, hey, dad, you want to have a catch? And, and you have that moment. They could have done something where it was just really quick and you got that a little bit easier, I thought. The, Rather than this entire conversation where it's, it's sort of just hammering away at you five times. We're, we're, we're nodding our heads mostly to patronize you, right? No, we, we, no. We, dis, we disagree. Well, with the Starks, I think, with, with both Starks, we, we know Howard and Tony, you know, through the years. And to me, it's like you have to have a conversation like that when you're talking about those two characters. I, I mean... They're but both you, very verbal, too. You're pointing out things that make me laugh because, in, in essence, I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> but uh, I, I think in the case of the characters, I'm going to stick with uh, that was a, a appropriate Okay, scene. so here's what I had next for the spoiler lounge. And this one actually has to do with uh, plot-wise in the movie. One of the issues that I had with the film, and, and a knock against it, I didn't like this, this element at all. So the, you had to have a way that Thanos in the past knew what was going on with the Avengers really at the time of when he was getting the stones to begin with. If, if I'm following their timeline wrong, it really gets crazy. But I hated that they had this moment with, uh, what's her name? Nub, Nub, Nubula? Nebula. Nebula. Nebula, where they call it that she had a time stamp on her brain or how this was done. I She's hated a computer. That entire, art, I just didn't like anything to hey, do with that. Did you, ever change, so, did you ever change time zones with your laptop? And okay. For him to figure it out, and it's okay, how often do people travel through time? And we're talking within 30 seconds. He's like, you know what? Check this timestamp on her. Why would he even think there's two of them? What is going on? And then next thing you know, he's in the future. And what? Did not care for that at he's all. He's after the time stone. Of course, he <laughs> knows care for stuff all. can happen, dude. He's Thanos. Well, also, too, you know, they showed a video recreation of what happened. I mean, you, you, you know, you can't really, uh, you know, when you see your head lopped off. He I sees think. his <laughs> own decapitation. That's got to be troubling. That's All right. troubling for anyone. Here's the big one that I threw at Matt K, and I'll present it like this. Okay. okay. I want to see what Pat thinks of this. Okay, five years have, have passed. From, my, from the idea of this story, five years have passed. They go back through time to fix everything, but those five years have passed. When we meet Spider-Man, he's still the same age. Right. And then at the very end, his closing moment, he's back in high school. And you see all the kids that he's with in high school. Five years have passed. So why is Spider-Man, my question, still in high school? And I have an answer, and it's very, very simple. Okay, okay so the snapping happened. Even in this new timeline, it's, it's been reconciled, it's been fixed, but it still happened. The people that didn't die, remember it. Peter Parker and his friends that, that turned to dust in the snap come back. Why the hell would they suddenly be in college? They still have to finish high school. They're still the same age they were when they, when they evaporated. They've come back, they, they continue so their studies. all those people... Not all or of them. Snapped. No, 50% of them. Exactly half. Okay. So why were they all in high school? Hey, then? it just so happens that Pete and all his friends were victims of the snap, oh, which really, flip a coin. Realistic. But why didn't the, the high school possibly close down? Because they didn't have enough people. You know, there's a lot now of... Now you're overthinking it, Well, man. no, no, man. It, it, it's just like the, the one thing I thought about, they didn't really have the science down of what happened after half the population leaves. If key people leave, for example, the internet's screwed. It, it goes down. You know, if, if oh, the key yeah. engineers turn to dust, we all turn to dust. Yeah, if 50% of the population went away, so, 100% would. So there, I was looking at some of the scenes. Now, interestingly, remember the scene around the Statue of Liberty? It's a, it's a, it's a port again. They have a bunch of boats around it, okay? Mm -hmm. But then when they have the scene with the Hulk, when we first see Bruce Banner, the Hulk, uh, and he's taking a picture with, with the, with the with iPhone. The yeah, no, oh, with yeah. an iPhone. So I said, okay, iPhone's exists, but we have to put a port around the Statue of Liberty because somehow we analog back to shipping. I, you know, I was, I was like a little confused about the science and nature of losing half the population of Earth and, and surviving afterwards. Yeah, it was desolate in some ways, and in right. other ways it was still the normal 
And was the real estate values in San Francisco still high? (laughs) Or because half the people had gone? If the population of San Francisco doesn't go away in this half, then it's still going to be... You know, okay. three thousand a month. And, for an and now, f- uh, for for the highlights of the movie that I didn't want to mention in the normal review, uh, I got a couple of them for you, and just your your reactions and your takes on them. There's yeah. the the I thought the best fan moment was when Captain America travels through time and is fighting the other Captain America who thinks that he's Loki. I thought that was fantastic setup. The writing and everything was great. I don't even think that was the best one. No, I'm just giving one. That was one. Okay. Good. You like that uh, moment? Absolutely. Mine also has to do with Captain America. And this is the only time in a press screening that I heard people like yell, cheer. And that was when Captain America grabs Thor's hammer. Molnir. Is this the moment? Molnir. Yes. His Let, hammer. Yes. That's, that's your moment. First of all, when Thor gets his hammer back, that's a moment in and of itself. But when Captain America picks up and wields the hammer in the final battle, holy shit, was that just a yeah kind of thing. I mean, I cheered and I, I really try not to because I remember the Shazam screening and the guy sitting next to me squeaking and squealing at every little thing. I'm like, oh my God, man, just calm down. I mean, yeah, it's cool and all, but relax. But I couldn't help it. I mean, I was like, yeah. I was excited. I didn't at all. I didn't really understand why it was such a big moment. How about you, Pat? Well, you know, I kind of dug the cameos. I, I like uh, Ken Jeong. Mm-hmm. And it, he didn't even speak a word. He just played the security guard. And uh, and, and the African-American actress, my, the name is escaping me, went at, in the 1970s sequence where she was on the elevator with them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful cameo. You know, they just wanted to be part of it. And, you know, they got their opportunity. But, you know, being a, a child in the 1970s, I dug the 70s uh, sequence with, with Michael Douglas and his long... You know, you know, uh, uh, streets of San Francisco <laughs> hair. And, Come how, on. and let's give credit to the Russos for getting that last shot when Tony Stark had passed away and they're, they're sort of, uh, they're putting his heart out to the ocean and then the camera tracks through all the different groups of the mm, Avengers. There's no, there's no doubt that, there, there, no way they were all filmed at the same time. I thought the same thing. So I thought, well, my God, this is going on for so long and everybody who's <laughs> ever been in a Marvel movie is, is on the screen. Beautiful. They must have filmed this all on green Green screen in yeah. a way that just got every actor. I thought, tip the cap to them, man. They got this done well. And was that one shot? Was that one shot just, you know, they did a tracking, tracking shot, shot through everybody? Yep. It's uh, that was And then nice. the ultimate, we won't, that's such a spoiler, I won't give it away. <laughs> well, now I'm curious. What, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the last man in that shot. In the uh, in the morning, show. I don't think that's that big of a spoiler. <laughs> I mean, really? Of course, he's there. Well, yeah, but it, it, it's just it's badass. It is badass. The so, whole thing is right. badass. The whole thing is badass. That was our spoiler talk on <laughs> Avengers Endgame. Is there anything other than than the one we just mentioned that we didn't spoil? Well, there's a, a huge one we didn't spoil. Well, can go we? on. Yeah, we can. This All is, right. What, what do you got, Pat? All right. Uh, Just so there, 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 there's a time paradox, uh, of course, and and we, they have to give the stones back after they use them to oh, save the good world. You brought this up. I forgot. So yes. Cap in America volunteers to do it, and while he goes back, he decides to go back to his old life and live it to the end. So when we see him again. He is a World War II old man. Pretty touching, too. Boy, and yeah, very touching, except for the giving of the shield. That was a little... (laughs) That was a little much. It was a little yeah. hand-fisted. It, hey, this is again, this is again with uh, Marvel. Let's just make sure they got it and hit it on the head two more times. We have a new Captain America. Uh, well. Not sure they got it, so let's do it one more time and give him the shield. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. liked the uh, special effects makeup. I thought it looked fantastic. Mm-hmm. And I'll give you one. I, I was talking about how they, um, they cast a light on the new characters that are coming in. I thought the moment uh, right in the battle when Black Panther came out of the uh, portal that Doctor Strange would have made, I guess, and they all walked through there. There was a moment where they held the camera between Captain America looking at Black Panther where it it gave us, the audience, sort of the uh, passing of the torch. Like, this is the end of this, this is end of this generation's heroes and it's your turn to shine now. Did you, did you know the moment he, yes. he glanced at him and there was a, it, it paused a little bit. He looked at him and it was like, yep, 
you know, he's going to be the new leader to, you know, Black Panther's going to be our guy. You were really noticing the Russo takes. I love that, man. Yeah. Hey, you really, what I do. you really, yeah. That, I mean, the, the, the freeze, the, 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 the looks. The still know. images. Yes. 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 Um, anything else? I mean, one. dude, we could talk about this movie for. I know. Yes, but we'll keep going on and on. So. Yeah, no, that's fine. I feel that's... bad for giving the old man. Hey, this is the away. spoiler lounge. <laughs> we're we're going to be drinking all night talking more Avengers. It's been a blast. Uh, for for the end of Jaw, for the official end of the Jaw, I'm Ryan, the movie guy. I'm Matt Kay, and, and keep, keep on, on John about, about the movies. movies.